Hello, welcome to Communication 108, Communication and Social Interaction. We'll be covering Chapters 4 and 5, Verbal and Non-Verbal Communication. So we're going to start off with the most basic element of verbal communication, which is words. Words are a collection of symbols that make up a language. So in reference to the English alphabet, we have the conventional A, B, C, D, and why does it start like that? It's because people assign those symbols a particular meaning, and that meaning is completely arbitrary. Those symbols are arbitrary. Somebody literally just said, hey, we're going to take that A, and it's going to have this shape, and we're going to eventually have it spell these kinds of things. There is no direct relationship between the word and the thing. Other countries use different symbols to create their words. So on the lower left hand side you'll see the Russian alphabet and then on the lower right hand side you'll see the Chinese um, symbols which stand for ideas and for words. So the word for guard is a combination of symbols including man, entrance, and tree. Words evolve over time. So when we think of words, we have to think of them as verbal symbols. And they change and they become outdated and the meanings evolve. So for example, the word wench. It was originally a shortened form of the Old English word wenchel, which referred to children of either gender. Then the word wench evolved to mean a female child. Eventually it was referred, used to refer to female servants, and ultimately it now means a wanton woman, or a kind of a loose lady or a lady friend of a pirate. And if you type in wench into Google, you'll get lots and lots of pictures of pirate women uh, like the young lady on the right here. So language in regards to these word things we have is a system of words and rules of grammar that allow you to engage in communication. Language is more than just a tool to communicate a message. It creates meaning and that's a very important element. It creates meaning and it can move people to action and it can be just as powerful as any weapon. One of the most famous American speeches starts with this phrase. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin but by the content of their character. And that phrase comes from a speech by Martin Luther King and it was during the Civil Rights Movement and it actually is not at the beginning of the speech, it's in the middle of the speech, but it's so powerful that it is the most important part of that speech and it plays over and over again um, on Martin Luther King Day. So it harnessed the power of peaceful protest and allowed the civil rights movement to gain legitimacy in this country in a way that no violence ever could. So when we understand language in the communication cycle, we have to understand that these symbols that we use within language are open to interpretation. And this involves the process of encoding and decoding. When we encode, we put thoughts and feelings into verbal symbols, nonverbal symbols, or both. Whereas with decoding, we're interpreting those messages based on hearing those verbal symbols, observing the nonverbal messages, or both. So everything we're communicating, whether we're doing it verbally 
or non-verbally is a matter of encoding and decoding. So we're constantly trying to interpret what the other person is meaning as they are communicating with us and as we are communicating with them. Additionally, words have a very different level of meaning. We have what's called the denotive meaning, which is the very literal conventional meaning that most people in a culture have agreed upon. And then there's the connotative meaning, which is derived from one's personal or subjective experience. So for example, we have the word chicken. And here's our little chicken up here. And he, if you look at the denotive meaning, means a farmyard animal that is delicious when you deep fry him. Now, when you look at the connotative meaning, in the United States especially, a connotative meaning of the word chicken means you're a coward. So on the playground, when somebody says you're a chicken, that means that you are too afraid or too cowardly to try to do something. You won't take the dare. Words also describe what we perceive. There are, of course, concrete things. So we can see it, smell it, taste it, touch it, hear it. A truck, cookie, moon, the cookie monster. Then we have abstract ideas. And these are things that are unable to be seen, smelled, tasted, touched, or heard. These are things that are felt. Love, hate, sadness. Um, that quote on the right hand side by Pablo Neruda who is a great poet of love po poetry he wrote love is so short and forgetting is so long and if you've ever had your heart broken you'll know exactly what that means now there are some wonderfully unique aspects to language as well we have what's called an idiom which is a word or a phrase that has an understood meaning within a culture. So in England, if you are pissed, that means you are drunk. Whereas in the United States, that word might mean you are angry. In the United States, when we say something costs an arm and a leg, we know that we won't actually be losing any limbs. Or maybe we will, and that's a whole other ball of wax. Also in the United States, we have such charming um, idioms as waking up on the wrong side of the bed, um, other things like um, she's two-faced. There are all kinds of these idioms that if a person comes from another culture, they don't necessarily make any sense. Then, then we have the word euphemism, which is a milder word substituted for another word that is more blunt or negative. So instead of getting fired, maybe your boss lets you go. So it doesn't sound so harsh. Instead of someone dying, a person passes away. And again, what you begin to see here with these euphemisms is that you're trying to take the sting out of the word. And, you know, what's the purpose behind it? Mm, it's basically to make it less brutal, in a sense. Um, you can also use it in terms of trying to make the word uh, less offensive. Instead of using a very um, inappropriate word in front of your mom, you might say darn instead of um, damn. Or you can use that flipping guy instead of the other F word that many of us like to use. Now another aspect of language is something that has recently become very interesting and very well researched. It's called code switching. And code switching is shifting back and forth between languages or language variations in different situations. So why do we code switch? Well, many of us code switch because we want to fit into our environment, such as when we speak more professionally at work versus more casually with our friends. 
You know, we might curse and joke around and call each other names with our friends, and we would never speak like that in front of our boss. In other ways, we want to ingratiate ourselves into a group because we are treated better. So, for example, in some countries, when you try to speak the language, the people who are native to that country are nicer to you. Um, in some countries, when you walk in and you try to speak the language, like in France, and you say, bonjour, um, they're going to be much nicer th to you than if you're um, obnoxious and are like, hey there. Um, you know, and in other countries, you walk in and if you have an accent that is similar to the accent of the country, you'll get the local pricing instead of the tourist pricing. Additionally, sometimes you want to communicate to a friend without letting others know what we are talking about. So many of us have been in situations where we've been standing in line or standing in a group of people and two people are having a conversation in English and they switch to a foreign language and they start giggling and of course we're all convinced that they're talking about us. Um, and then sometimes the perfect word does not exist in English. There's this wonderful word in German called Schadenfreude, which doesn't exist in English. It's basically not adding insult to injury. Not only are you humiliating the person, but you're humiliating them to the maximum degree. One of the most significant aspects of language is the fact that a lot of our language is destructive. And we don't even realize that it's destructive. Um, because what we're being told is, oh, it's politically correct to change our language. When in fact, it's just tradition. And tradition doesn't mean it's right. So for example, we have sexist language woven through everything in our language. Language that is demeaning to one sex or gender is sexist. Throughout all textbooks, throughout all magazines, the generic he was appropriate and used up until the 1990s. And this was the subject of the sentence when it is of an unknown gender or includes both men and women, we always just refer to them as he. Additionally, we have these man-linked words. Words that include the word man, but operate generically to include women as well. And it seems harmless. It seems like it doesn't matter. It seems like women are having a fit over something that's completely unimportant. But what it does is it sends a subconscious message to young girls that the masculine form is the preferred form. So look at some of these examples and we're going to actually start from the bottom up. Mankind. Well, look at the options. You can say humanity. Humankind. A person needs his sleep. People need their sleep. Postman is a letter carrier. Freshman, first year student, so on and so forth. You know, when, when you see a policeman and they are a woman, is that accurate? No, it's a policewoman. The reality in all of this is that we have to use language specifically. And when we just assume that people will understand that using the masculine doesn't presume the person is a man, we're not being accurate. Another type of destructive language is racist language. And especially in the United States, we've learned language that reflects the thoughts that, some, that values one race over another without even realizing it. And, you know, for example, and this is one of those things that most people don't even think about. You have angel food cake and devil's food cake. The angel's food cake is white. Devil's food cake is brown. Why is the good one white and the evil one brown? 
Just asking. It's ridiculous, but it's also, when you look at it from a larger context in society, kind of ridiculous and offensive. So, you know, you can look at a number of these examples and say, well, why? Why is it like that? And it's because it's so inbred in our language and our rhetoric that it has become part of the language we use and it continually becomes this perception that white is good and dark is bad. Then we have homophobic language and this is offensive to the homosexual and gay community. And the most common one we hear a lot is, oh my god, that is so gay. And I've heard gay people say, that is so gay. And they laugh. And, you know, the question is, why is gay a synonym for lame? Gay is supposed to be a synonym for fabulous. But instead, it's become a synonym for lame. And again, why is being gay lame? When in fact, some of the most beloved people on TV, like Ellen DeGeneres, are gay and people love them. So, you know, this destructive language insinuates itself into our lives and especially into young people's lives and they just assume this is normal and we have to be very aware of how we use language. Next, we want to look at how we see the world. And this is called perspective taking. When we look at the world from an alternate point of view, so whether you are Caucasian, Asian, African, African American, Hispanic, you see the world through the filter of your experiences and the challenge is to try to see the world from somebody else's perspective. Now this little comic here kind of details the challenge of this. You see the guy on the abandoned desert island and he sees a boat. Now the guy who's stuck on a little boat he sees a guy on an island and they both think they're saved when in reality it is pretty clear that they're both abandoned and probably going to die and they'll probably eat each other and they'll both be just skeletons and it'll be sad and everybody will cry at some point but the point is looking at the world differently takes effort and we have to gain perspective on the experiences of each other in order to gain a better understanding of how to utilize language. Where do we start? We start with the I versus you messages. We have to take responsibility for our own thoughts and feelings through I messages. They help us acknowledge our own position and help prevent defensiveness in a listener. So whereas a you message may sound accusatory and critical, the I message says, well, this is how I'm feeling. So here are some very specific examples. So starting up at the top, you are insensitive. And the I message is, I need you to pay attention to me. Now, this is very productive whether you are in a professional or a personal setting. However, with this caveat, in a personal setting, you have what's known as that love relationship. And when love is included in any kind of relationship, there's going to be a heightened sense of emotion. Whereas in a work relationship, no matter how good of friends you might be, you might be lacking in that relationship of um, I, the idea of loving one another that you wouldn't walk away. So, you know, you have to remember that a personal relationship may be a little bit more challenging. So, um, you messages, you make me mad. I message, I get angry when you ignore me. You message, you don't understand anything. 
iMessage. I don't feel understood when you interrupt me. And so on and so forth. The key here is we want to avoid sounding accusatory because that immediately puts the other person on the defensive. Because as soon as we start shouting accusations at people, they immediately put up that wall and stop listening. Whereas if you're trying to express yourself from that I expression, that I feel this, I need this, I want this, then you're expressing your needs and not criticizing their actions. So we're going to move on to nonverbal communication next. And this is the process of communicating through sending and receiving wordless messages. And this can be communicated through gesture and touch. You know, sometimes a hug can be more impactful than 75,000 words. Body language or posture, if someone is standing shoulders back, smiling, you can tell they're in a good place. Whereas somebody who is hunched over and have a very sad expression, maybe not so happy. Facial expression and eye contact. Somebody who's not making eye contact, especially in the United States, there may be a problem. And even through an object communication, such as clothing, hairstyles, and even architecture, can tell you about that person. Somebody who's in all black, they've dyed their hair black, they've got black makeup on, they've got black clothes on, black boots. This is somebody who is trying to identify themselves in a very dark way. Now, maybe in five years they'll be back to wearing pink little dresses, but for this time this is how they're feeling about themselves and the world around them. Now as an example, of the difference between masculine and feminine architecture. You see here on the left hand side the Sydney Opera House in Australia with its curving lines of the feminine almost look like bra cups um, and that was a intentional thing because of course the acoustics work better with these kind of shapes but it also represents the epitome of art and culture Whereas on the right hand side, you have um, these rugged, massive straight lines of the masculine. And you see a lot of these types of buildings in the old Soviet Union of Eastern Europe. And it was meant to demonstrate power and dominance. And again, what you begin to see is that there are a lot of nonverbal um, messages being sent from these particular architectural styles. When we look at nonverbal communication, it is usually studied in a face-to-face -face interaction. And it is classified into three principal areas. Number one, environmental conditions where the communication takes place. So is it taking place in an office, at home, outside? Is it taking place in a um, positive environment, a negative environment? Then you have your physical characteristics of the communicators. Is someone an adult and the other person a child? Is someone the boss and another person is an employee? Are the people involved equal to one another? Then the behaviors of the communicators during the interaction. Is someone very, very angry and the other person being very, very passive? Are both people very, very angry? Are both people being very passive? So on and so forth. In the 1960s, a researcher by the name of Paul Ekman published a very influential study on facial expressions in reference to nonverbal communication. And he determined that expressions of anger, disgust, fear, joy, sadness, and surprise are universal. So wherever you go in the world, 
you are going to see the same types of responses when someone is angry, disgusted, afraid, happy, sad, or surprised. Over the following 30 or 40 years, of course, you know, you had a lot of critics of this, and Ekman moved on to study what was known as micro-expressions. And these are very quick facial expressions involuntarily made by people in particular circumstances. And it's almost impossible to hide these micro-expressions. So what he did was he looked at the universal facial expressions and then he added micro-expressions that he felt were also universal but are not as obvious. And they include contempt, amusement, contentment, embarrassment, excitement, guilt, pride and achievement, relief, satisfaction, sensory pleasure, and shame. You know, when you find out that someone is okay, you have this feeling of satisfaction and or relief, and your body kind of just relaxes a little. And maybe it's only for a second, but it happens, and you go back to being on guard for whatever is happening next. So, how do we make meaning with all this nonverbal stuff? Research has suggested that between 60 and 70 percent of all meaning is derived from nonverbal behavior. Interestingly, research has also shown that height has been found to show that taller people are perceived as being more impressive. That managers in the United Kingdom who are taller are more likely to be promoted. And in the United States, research has shown that if you are taller, you're more likely to make more money. And if you try to make yourself look taller, you'll make more of an impact when you're speaking. So something that is so arbitrary like height has an incredible sense of meaning when it comes down to how people perceive you. So some more research findings. Um, in 1970, a researcher named Argyle put forward the hypothesis that whereas spoken language is used for communicating information, nonverbal communication is used to communicate attitudes. So on average, women are better at nonverbal communication than men are. And what this essentially means is that women who have been allowed over the past 4,000 years to express themselves more emotionally by society have a better intuitive sense of attitude and emotion and men who've been allowed to be more physically demonstrative have a better understanding of information and communicating that. So, you know, what we're really looking at is this idea of evolution and how it has changed the way we communicate. You know, and that doesn't mean that men and women can't catch up with each other. It just means that society has shaped the way men and women perceive communication. And as such, you know, you can't blame a man or a woman, your husband or your wife, for not being good enough or not being satisfactory at a particular communication skill because they have literally 4,000 years of history to overcome. So how do you improve your body language? Well, first one is eye contact. Eye contact increases your credibility. And also, you know, in the United States, it says you're, you're, you're trustworthy, you're honest, you can trust me. Additionally, if you smile frequently, you will be perceived as being a more likable, friendly, warm, and approachable person. Now, you don't want to go grinning like a maniac or the Joker in Batman, but a good smile, and again, go stand in front of a mirror, practice a nice smile, will be a effective way to improve your body language. Another way to improve your body language 
is to gesture while you're speaking. If you don't, you might come across as being very stiff and boring. And I'm not talking about doing windmills. I'm just talking about using your hands in a very normal way. Also, some head nods, some positive reinforcement to your audience, a little gesturing. It just shows that you are listening to them. Stand up straight, but don't be rigid like you're standing at attention in the military. Lean slightly forward. Communicates that you are approachable and receptive, and more importantly, friendly. Never speak to your audience with your back turned. Don't look at the floor. Don't look at the ceiling. It communicates disinterest. What you need to do is make sure you keep eye contact. Bounce from person to person as you look at them. This will demonstrate that you are interacting with each member of the audience. Now in the United States, and we've talked about this in class, the cultural norm is about 18 inches to two feet from one another. So if you're standing from away from someone, you want to be about an arm's length away. If you get much closer than that, the other person may feel very uncomfortable. If they step back, it's because you're standing too close. You have to be very aware of the cultural norms of the country you're in. Another aspect is called mirroring. And this does not mean that you are going to imitate the person move for move. Instead, what it does is it allows you to follow the lead of the person you are interacting with. And this is especially helpful in interviewing situations. Think of it like dancing. If the person you're being interviewed by is very animated and uses their hands to speak a lot, feel free to be very animated and use your hands a lot. On the other hand, if the person who is interviewing you is very quiet and is, you know, very like almost zen like in a way, then you need to be like that. You follow their lead and that will allow you to make them feel comfortable and they will feel comfortable interviewing you. Other ways to improve your body language cues that show you are listening more effectively and we're going to talk about this in a lot more detail later on when we get to chapter 6. Nodding, smiling, leaning forward, the furrowed brow that shows you're really thinking hard about what they're saying. But before we move forward I want to just say this. You want to never ever 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 do this. When you're asked a question and you have to come up with an answer. You never want to look up and to the left. The reason for this is it is a micro expression that you are creating a lie. And the way this is interpreted is that your left side of your brain controls your creativity. And so when you look up and to the left, the implication is that you're creating a story. Whereas if you look up and to the right, you're remembering something. If you look down, that's fine. But looking up and to the left is a big no-no, especially for people who are well-versed in nonverbal communication. So let's cover some tips for understanding nonverbal communication. Recognize that people communicate on many levels. Watch their facial expressions, eye contact, posture, hand and feet movements, body movement and placement, and appearance and passage as they walk towards you. So you want to watch everything. Every gesture is communicating something if you listen with your eyes. Doesn't that sound very zen? Become accustomed to watching nonverbal communication and your ability to read nonverbal communication will grow with practice. And again, every time you pay attention and you see something, you're going to get better at it. Now, one of the things that 
people often notice is that her someone says one thing, but their nonverbal communication seems to be saying something else. You should focus on the nonverbal communication because that's usually the right message. So think about this. Friend of yours or your girlfriend or your boyfriend or whomever friend appears upset and you say, hey, is everything okay? And they say the dreaded words, everything is fine. And we all know when somebody says the word fine, they are saying, I am going to kill someone today. And what they really want you to do is keep digging until you find out what the situation is. And of course, what their nonverbal communication is showing you is that they are really upset. Their body is tight, they're closed in, they look upset, and again, what their nonverbal communication is saying is a way more accurate than the words coming out of their mouth. Now the next pieces of information came out of a book that I got years ago on how to hire good people. And I just love this information because I found it very helpful in my career. You want to assess the job candidates based on their nonverbal communication. Because to be honest, everybody basically says the same stuff during a job interview. And you can read volumes about how the applicant sits in the lobby because the reality is that they don't realize that people are watching them. In my career, when I used to interview people all the time, I used to always ask the receptionist, how did they treat you? Because if somebody treats the receptionist rudely, that person is going to be a two-faced person meaning they'll be nice to me, but to anybody they see as below them, they're going to be rude. The nonverbal communication during an interview will expose the candidate's skills, strengths, weaknesses, and concerns. And that is so true. You know, if you have somebody who's nervous, that's fine. But if you have somebody who's super cocky, and you know they're like sitting back with they their legs spread wide open and they're being full of themselves that's going to tell you this guy is going to be or girl is going to be really hard to manage finally probe non-verbal communication during any kind of investigation or other situation in which you need facts and believable statements when leading a meeting or speaking to a group Recognize that nonverbal cues can tell you A. When you've talked long enough, you get it when you get people like dozing off, staring at the ceiling, looking out the window, checking their phones, when someone else wants to speak, and the mood of the crowd and the reaction to your remarks. If you say something offensive, you will see it in their faces. And as such, you want to make sure you clarify your remarks, especially if your intention was not to offend anyone. So that finishes up chapters four and five. If you have any questions, feel free, as always, to email or text me. Have a fabulous day, and uh, I will talk to you later.